Good evening and welcome to the University of Chicago, Francis and Rose Yuen campus in Hong Kong for the first episode of our new fall lecture series, Hong Kong Redux, developed by the Yuen campus team. My name is Mark Barnico and I'm the executive director of the University of Chicago, Francis and Rose Yuen campus in Hong Kong, U Chicago's premier location in Asia, representing our values of free and open discourse, rigorous debate, and the exchange of ideas. We're streaming tonight's event live via Zoom, Facebook, and YouTube. And I'd like to remind the audience members, you can submit your questions through the questions and answer button by first registering on Zoom. For news and information on the latest UN campus events, please check out our website, www.uchicago.hk, or follow the UChicago UN campus Facebook page. Next Thursday, September 10th at 8.30 p.m., we'll launch another exclusive UN campus series called the U.S. Presidential Election Series with Professor William Howell from the University of Chicago Political Science Department. I hope you can join us. Programs in the Hong Kong Redux series will take you on a nostalgic journey back in time. In parallel with unique Hong Kong Redux online lectures and panels, we also plan to open an art exhibition on the UN campus called Hong Kong Impressions, featuring paintings and photographs from the 1940s through the 1970s in partnership with the Chinese University of Hong Kong Art Museum. We also plan a photographic exhibit this fall called Memories of a Bygone Era, Resettlement in Hong Kong, 1950 to 1972 in our Heritage Museum. Both exhibits will be supplemented with lectures and panel discussions in English and Cantonese throughout the fall beginning next week Tonight, we will discuss Xu Xu's influence after 1949 and new translations of Xu Xu's works by our guest professor, Frederick Green. Xu Xu was a pivotal figure in 20th century literature. As an exile who made Hong Kong his home in the 1950s, Xu Xu helped to frame modern Hong Kong literary culture and elements of those works can be found in other medium from that time and even today. While much of Xu Xu's Hong Kong fiction explored the experience of Chinese exiles and was steeped in nostalgia, his neo-romantic tendencies also linked Hong Kong literature to a global artistic and literary modernity. Tonight we have two experts, Professor Han Saucy and Frederick Green, to discuss Xu Xu's life and works. Our guest, Frederick Green, is an associate professor of Chinese at San Francisco State University, He's published widely on the literature and culture of the Qing Dynasty and the Republican period, Sino-Japanese cultural relations, post-socialist Chinese cinema, and contemporary Chinese art. Frederick's book published this year, Bird Talk and Other Stories by Xu Xu, Modern Tales of a Chinese Romantic, is a study and anthology of translations of works by the Chinese writer Xu Xu. Frederick holds a BA in Chinese studies from Cambridge University and an MPhil and PhD in Chinese literature from Yale University. Professor Han Saucy is a professor at the University of Chicago in Comparative Literature, the Committee on Social Thought and East Asian Languages and Civilization. He has a special distinction as a university professor. University professors are selected for internationally recognized eminence in their field, as well as for their potential for high impact across the university. Only 23 members of the University of Chicago faculty have received this honor, and only 10 university professors hold this distinction today. Han holds multiple appointments at the University of Chicago and serves on the faculty advisory boards of the Posen Family Center for Human Rights, Neubauer Family Collegian for Culture and Society, and Stevanovich Institute on the Formation of Knowledge. He received a BA in Greek and Comparative Literature from Duke University, and his PhD in comparative literature from Yale University. Han has taught at the University of California, Los Angeles, Stanford University, Yale University, City University of Hong Kong, University de Paris Troisième, and the University of Otago. Han's work has been supported by the Guggenheim Foundation and the Stanford Humanities Center. From 2009 to 2011, Han was president of the American Comparative Literature Association, and he's also a member of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. Han's recent books include the translations When Pepperitz Sings, Selected Poems of Jean Mathieu, Texts and Transformations, 
translation as citation, Zhuangzi Inside Out, which received the Wellick Prize from the American Comparative Literature Association. The Ethnography of Rhythm, Orality and Its Technologies, which was awarded the Scaglioni Prize by the Modern L Language Association. And two of his earlier books have been published in Chinese translation. Great Walls of Discourse, Hua Yu de Changcheng, Wen Hua Zhongguo, Tian Xian Ji, and The Problem of a Chinese Aesthetic, Zhongguo Mei Xue Wen Ti. Han has many other interests, including Chinese musicology, the Great Qing Dynasty novel Hong Long Meng, the history of the idea of oral literature, Haitian poetry, the healthcare for the global poor, and contemporary art. We're delighted to have Han and Frederick join us this evening. Han, I'll turn the floor over to you to get us started. All right. Thank you, Mark, uh, for that very generous introduction. Uh, so, Fred, we've known each other for a long time. Uh, we first met when you were in graduate school. And, you know, I just have one question to start out with. I, I see a lot of people uh, coming to graduate school to work on modern Chinese literature. And as you know, I'm not really a modernist person, but, you know, you get familiar with the major names. And I would say, you know, most people come uh, wanting to work on, say, Lu Xun, or maybe Ba Jin, Mao Dun, Lao She, Lin Yutang, Zhang Ailing, you know, those sorts of canonical writers people who are known, who've been translated for a long time, who are seen as having a big impact on the canon of modern Chinese literature. And Xu Xu, although I think everybody in Hong Kong and Taiwan would know him, uh, people from the English language or European language areas wouldn't have so many opportunities to encounter him until now, because thanks to your translation, that door is now open and people can become acquainted with him. But how did you ever run across Xu Xu? How did you develop an interest in him? What, what was your first impression of this writer? Yeah, well, thank you first, Mark and Han, for inviting me and to be part of this lecture series. It's really a tremendous pleasure. Um, to get to your questions, you know, I didn't know Xu Xu when I came to graduate school. I came to graduate school to, yeah, work on Lu Xu, no, actually on Zhou Zoren. That was my, you know, what I thought I was gonna do. Um, and I chanced upon Xu Xu really um, while combing through our university library uh, for a seminar on Republican period journals. Um, you know, as you know, a lot of Republican period or May 4th literature is, is pretty grim. You know, it's not a very cheerful period or, you know, a lot of literature from that period. And when I started to read Xu Xu's fiction, um, which, you know, has these modern ghost stories, right? He had a lot of exotic fiction, these uh, first person narrators traveling to Europe and, uh, you know, having romances abroad. I was just captivated. And I, I, at the time I was looking for a dissertation topic and I just immediately knew, okay, I have my topic, I have my writer. And um, so I started to work on him um, on the, in the dissertation. I then really focused on the idea of romanticism, the revival of uh, uh, romanticism in the 20th century and how Xu Xu fit into that. But um, yeah, I always had this idea of, of translating some of his work and making it available to a wider audience in the West. And um, a couple of years ago, I had a sabbatical. I was in Taiwan. I finally had some time to do this. And um, here we go. <laughs> right, yeah. I can, I can see the appeal. You know, graduate school can often be a pretty grim experience. So, you know, maybe writers whose uh, favorite topics are cannibalism and oppression and suicide and war uh, resonate with the graduate student mind. But I think you had a healthy instinct for escapism that drew you to this <laughs> romantic uh, author of, of travel and the uncanny and may I say parenthetically that the Yale University Library is to be praised for their amazing collection of everything under the sun. No matter how out of the way or unknown, somebody at Yale has decided to acquire it. And if it's not in printed books, it will be in the manuscripts of the Beinecke Library. I think you know, most of what I've done in the 40 some years since I left Yale has been 30 some years since I left Yale, sorry, 
uh, has, has been drawn out of the things that I was able to read in that amazing university library. So I know it's a digression, but I just have to give honor where honor is due. But, but getting back to Xu Xu now, um, so his life, his career, surely they can't have been quite as romantic as the things that he writes about in his novels, or maybe I'm wrong. How did he end up in Hong Kong? What drew him there? And, and his reputation, you know, he's been gone for, what, 30 years now. Uh, how about his posthumous reputation? Can you tell us a little bit more about the relationship between this writer and this place, Hong Kong? Okay, yeah. Um, so, you know, maybe I start um, with a sort of just a trajectory of his career. Yeah, how he got to um, Hong Kong. And I think um, we have some slides uh, uh, that go with that. Chris, maybe we can pull those up. So, um, you know, Xu Xu was born in 1908. He died in 1980. And as such, he really lived through some of the, the big social changes that occurred uh, in 20th century China. And his fiction is really tied up with a lot of those events in very interesting ways. Um, so, you know, he, he's actually also known as Xu. Uh, in, I think in Hong Kong, mostly he's known as Xu. Uh, he actually preferred that pronunciation as his pen name, but uh, for some reason we kind of got stuck with Xu Xu, that sort of uh, stuck, especially in the West. He studied philosophy and psychology at Peking University in the late 20s and early 30s, uh, where he developed an intense interest in the philosophy of Henri Bergson, French philosopher who had won the Nobel Prize in literature in 1927, and who was really all the rage at the time, um, globally speaking, including in China, and whose work on intuition and creativity had a big impact on a lot of European writers, modernists, including Proust. Maybe we'll talk a little bit about that later. Um, he then moves to Shanghai in the early 30s, and he comes under the auspices of Lin Yutang, the um, polyglot writer and critic who ran a number of very successful uh, literary ventures and journals. And Xu Xu becomes editor for a couple of these uh, journals, The Analects, uh, This Human World, but he also starts to write. He's, at first, he, he writes mostly poetry, free verse poetry. He starts to compose essays. And a lot of these essays, and that I think shows Lin Yutang's influence, are interested in, you know, they look at East-West cultural comparison. Um, and that was, of course, very, you know, a popular topic in Shanghai at the time, this very cosmopolitan place. But he also starts to write his own fiction. And he really embraces a distinctly cosmopolitan liberalism. And, um, you know, a lot of this early fiction is also sort of steeped in exoticism. Uh, he then travels to Paris, he goes to Paris. He wants to, you know, he studies abroad in Paris in 1936. Um, I quoted a line here from one of his early works. Uh, it's a, it's a, a short story called The Goddess of the Arabian Sea, where this Chinese, you know, first person narrator travels to Europe and aboard a steamer, he meets this mysterious woman who claims to be a sorceress. Um, and the narrator in this novel sort of, you know, he, he says, oh, you know, I, I love this. I seek out the real within dreams. And it's nice because it sort of epit epitomizes a lot of Xu Xu's uh, kind of aesthetics of that time, namely that, you know, this interest in dreams and the surreal. And um, I think it's also sort of, you know, the Bergsonian influence here, sort of transforming reality through art. Um, while he's in Paris, he publishes what is probably his best, well, one of his best known short stories called uh, Ghost Love, actually, yeah, a longer short story novella, Gui Lian, which appears in another popular journal um, another of uh, Lin Yutang's ventures, Celestial Wind. Um, and it's sort of a Gothic tale um, set in contemporary Shanghai. And again, we have this uh, very uh, confident cosmopolitan first person narrator. He meets this mysterious woman who claims to be a ghost this time. Um, and it became quite a, a success in Shanghai. It was sort of a literary, it, it really uh, 
lifted him on the, the, the literary uh, pedestal. He became very well known afterwards. Um, maybe we can go to the next slide. He returned then uh, from Paris to Shanghai after the outbreak of war, uh, after uh, you know, the outbreak of war with Japan. Like a lot of Chinese students, he came back, he sort of felt you know, that, that need to support the, the, the war. Um, but by returning to Shanghai, he stays in Shanghai at first, he keeps writing these exotic tales. Uh, and then in 1941, in late 1941, after Pearl Harbor, after all of Shanghai, including the foreign concession, is occupied, he leaves as well, and he goes to Chongqing. And in Chongqing, he writes what is probably his best known work or something, he, you know, the work he's best known for really, this epic wartime novel uh, called Feng Xiao Xiao, The Rustling Wind, which is sort of a spy love novel set in uh, just pre-war and then occupied Shanghai. And again, it really captured the reading public. Um, it was serialized over a whole year in this uh, wartime newspaper, Sao Dang Bao. Um, and again, it made him very well known, very popular. Um, one of the most widely read authors, definitely of the, of the period. He then, um, towards the end of the war, he had a short stint in America. He goes to America on behalf of the Sao Dang Bao as a, a, a journalist. And on the right here, I have um, a detail from his wartime passport uh, that was issued in 1943. And I wanted to include that because it's the earliest photograph I have of Xu Xu. So that's him there in 1943. Um, he then comes back after the, after the war, he goes back to Shanghai. Um, he publishes a lot of the works that he had written during the war years. A lot of them had not been published as books. They had pub been published in journals. And, you know, he's, he's, he's just very well known, very successful. He buys a house in, in Ningbo. He kind of plans to just go back to Ningbo. He, he marries again, uh, his second wife, and he just wants to settle down and write. And then um, history happens, right? The civil war breaks out. Um, maybe we can have the next slide. Um, because of his, you know, literary aesthetics, all throughout the 30s and 40s, he had been criticized by, uh, by leftist critics. So there's this prominent uh, critic, Barin, who in 1939 had called his fiction a bomb full of poison, capable of extinguishing the fighting spirits of thousands of revolutionaries. And then um, another critic, Shi uh, Huai Chi, uh, in 1945, writes specifically about this novella, Gui Li and Ghost Love, it will invariably cause you to forget the cruel reality of the world, cause you to ignore the hideous scars of our nation, um, and lead you to distance yourself from that cruel struggle between old and new that is currently being carried out all around us. Instead, it will invite you to enter an illusionary world. And you know, that's quite ironic because yes, I think that's exactly what Xu Xu wanted to do in his fiction. You know, he kind of, <laughs> he wanted to steer you away from all those terrible things that happen and invite you to, you know, transcend all that pain. But of course, in the eyes of more progressive writers, you know, that was of course terrible. Um, you know, most of the literary left had of course endorsed realism and social realism. And here we have Xu Xu, this, you know, romantic idealist writer um, writing about ghosts. So that was really a problem. And yeah. Xu Xu realized that. Mm -hmm. um, he realized that that would become a political liability. So in 1950, um, shortly after the founding of the PRC, he leaves and he goes to Hong Kong on what he thought would just be a temporary exile you know, let it just blow over and return after, you know, maybe a year or so. And he actually went alone. He left his wife um, and his newborn daughter in, uh, in, in China. Um, and he never got to see his wife again. And he only saw, um, you know, that daughter shortly before he, he passed away. So, you know, it's, uh, 
what happened to so many intellectuals at that time, right? They got really um, sort of washed up in the stream of history and he ended up in Hong Kong. So that's how he, he came to Hong Kong in, in 1950. And really he spent most of his career as a writer, as an intellectual then, the largest you know, stretch of time until 1980 in Hong Kong. Um, maybe we can have the next slide. And then in Hong Kong, one of the first works that he publishes is this beautiful um, novella, Bertog, Niao Yu. Um, yeah, that's, uh, that's very helpful to sort of frame him in his times. And, you know, I do have to give, you know, as you do, a little credit to the Marxist critics because they sound very stiff and ideological and doctrinaire. But the thing that they pounce on is this idea of escape or exoticism, right? Um, in in Xu Xu's stories, you often have this motif of the woman of mystery, right? She kind of incarnates this exoticism. And the narrator of the stories is in some way looking beyond a boundary, right? That's sort of what defines the exoticism. And it can be a, a boundary of many different kinds. Right, there's the boundary that constitute East and West as opposites. There's the boundary between men and women. There's the boundary between humans and animals as in the uh, Niao Yu bird talk story. You know, in each case, the narrator is discovering a world inside the world that the prosaic person wouldn't notice is there. So in a way, he's already built in a rebuke to these uh, realist critics, these uh, critics who want everyone to be engaging in the same kind of uh, social realism. Uh, and if I can just speak momentarily as somebody who reads traditional literature more than modern, uh, this sense of looking beyond a boundary is something that we get also in Zhuangzi, we get it in, you know, old stories like the Zhen Zhongji, you know, where the, the man has a dream and visits the kingdom of the ants, uh, you, found, you find it in the Liao Jai stories and in Ji Yun's ghost stories and so on. So in a way, he's picking up a lot of story architectures that come from way, way back in Chinese tradition, but he's making them modern by introducing uh, new kinds of backgrounds and new kinds of boundaries to be looking over. But let's, let's talk a little bit about, uh, about bird talk, about the story that you've chosen to represent the whole collection as, as its title. Uh, you know, there I, I see the human animal boundary becoming important, which is not the case elsewhere. And also there's a sort of a, an experience and innocence, if I could borrow a couple of words from the great William Blake, right? There's the experienced narrator who's a little bit soured on the world. And there's this innocent, beautiful young woman who can talk with the birds, right? But yeah. Um, what do you see that story as offering to the Chinese reader of its time? Right? Imagine that we're encountering this novel in the year of its publication. You know, what's, what's on the horizon? What are people thinking about? What are people maybe escaping from? You know, in other words, why does it stay in people's memory as such a representative work of this writer? Yeah. Um, so Bertok really was one of the first stories that he wrote after he got to Hong Kong. And it really epitomizes, I think, Xu Xu's aesthetics from Hong Kong, um, you know, as they sort of would evolve. And they really had changed, I think, from, from his earlier fiction. So if in a lot of the early fiction, we have these very confident first person narrators looking often for romance, sometimes, you know, romance in foreign countries, um, you know, meeting these myst mysterious women who claim to be ghosts. Um, the first person narrator in Hong Kong, so we, we, we still have that first person narrator. And what's interesting is that a lot of the time these first person narrators, they sort of share some of Xu Xu's own biography and they're often also called actually Xu Xu. Xu. That's, that's kind of funny. So that, you know, he continues to do that. We, we still have this first person narrator who shares Xu Xu's biography, but now we have this first person narrator who is stranded in Hong Kong, who is in exile, who is not happy in Hong Kong. He doesn't want to be there. He doesn't particularly like Hong Kong. Um, and 
instead of looking for romance, instead of looking for the exotic, he really looks for a lost happiness, happiness that, you know, that you might have known in a different time, in a different place. Um, there's sort of this longing always, a longing for, for home, a longing for a kind of metaphysical sanctuary. Um, and, you know, longing for a time that, that had passed. And, you know, the Republican period had come to an end. Um, you know, it was replaced by something else. The Cold War had gotten underway. This new reality probably dawned on him that no, he wouldn't be able to go back to Shanghai. He wouldn't go back to that, that old world, that life that he had known. And again, I think he shared that with a lot of his contemporaries, other writers. He shared that with a lot of his readers. Um, so this, this sense of, um, you know, of longing, uh, the pain of an exile, nostalgia, I think is something that, that you know, we find in a lot of his works. And of course, also in a lot of other uh, writers from that period who had gone to, to Hong Kong or, or maybe to Taiwan or even you know, other uh, Chinese uh, communities, including the United States. Um, you know, what's interesting is that Bertok was also Lin Yutang's favorite story by Xu Xu, which I think, you know, again, says a lot. Lin Yutang, of course, in a way, um, becomes an exile. Mm -hmm. Now, you know, the novella opens when this first person narrator then, you know, is stranded in Hong Kong. And he receives through the mail uh, a copy of the Diamond Sutra. And with it comes a letter that informs him of the passing of what we later learn uh, was his fiance called Unqian. And this then triggers a flashback. Most of the story is told as a flashback to the pre-war Chinese countryside uh, where um, you know, our first confident first person narrator from Shanghai is convalescing from, um, you know, from, from an illness, from a mental breakdown he had in, in, in Shanghai. And he meets then this young woman who was slighted by the other villagers uh, because of her unusual behavior, which, you know, today we, we sort of might describe her as autistic almost, but um, he discovers that she has this very unusual talent that she can communicate with birds. Um, so there is this almost sort of, you know, we, we touched upon that earlier, this kind of almost surreal angle, or again, this idea of seeking out the real within dreams, right? Transforming reality through art, accessing alternative realities through art or religion or sp special abilities. Again, this sort of defying the scientific almost, right? Mm -hmm. um, so, um, you know what, maybe... Um, What's a passage? I'm just thinking uh, it would be great to, to hear your rendition <laughs> of, of the, this story, of this narrative. Okay, I'll, I'll do a little, um, a little reading. So the, I, I have two little short passages. The first is when the narrator meets this, or, or sees this girl um, for the first time communicating with birds. It was a hazy morning. The sky was colorless, except for a faint red glow in the east. Soon, the birds in the bamboo thicket started to sing. At first, there was only one, chirping away in a clear, captivating way and flying from branch to branch. Another one began to sing as if answering the other. Just then, I heard a response from beyond the fence, and I caught sight of the girl wearing a gray dress her hair done up in two braids. A chorus of birds began chirping away from inside the bamboo thicket. The two birds that had sung to each other flew to the fence and began trilling at the girl on the other side. The girl raised her head. Her face was round and her eyes shone brightly. She bore a happy smile. The sounds she was making were beautiful. They neither, neither sounded like the trilling of birds nor did they sound like singing. The girl and the two birds seemed like old acquaintances. The birds flew back and forth between the fence and her shoulder and then landed on the fence and chirped affectionately. By then, the morning haze had already disappeared and the sun shone onto the dewy grass. 
I was able to see the girl's face clearer now. Her chin was pointed and she had thin lips and a delicate nose and a broad forehead. Her eyes were radiant. What was most astonishing was her skin. It seemed as if it had rarely been exposed to the sun. It was of a very light complexion, like porcelain, not at all like that of other country folk. Suddenly, a bird flew into the bamboo thicket. Had it noticed me? It called out from inside and then came flying out again. I could see that the girl was looking straight at me now, and I thought it best to come forward and greet her. Um, so he, the narrator then, you know, he's, he's really interested in this girl and he tries to teach her math and, and writing, sort of conventional topics, but it all proves futile, just as futile as she trying to teach him bird talk, which he really wants to learn. He, he wants to learn from her. And interestingly, it's only when they read poetry together that she experiences the same sublime pleasure and happiness and, as she does when listening to birds. And sort of almost inevitably, he kind of falls in love with her and he takes her to Shanghai with him. And of course, in Shanghai, she's, she's deeply unhappy. And eventually, he, sort of, he decides to leave his, his job in Shanghai and go back to the countryside with her and just live you know, live there with her. And on the way to the countryside, they stop over in this Buddhist convent where she then again displays an almost intuitive understanding of Buddhist sutras. And he just decides to, to just to leave her there. And I, I, I just want to read one short passage from there to the end. So he says, she did not belong with me she belonged in a world unspoiled by worldly matters. Only in such a world could her sublimity and magnificence manifest itself. Only in such a world could she truly feel at ease and be happy. I would be of no help or value to her. I had become superfluous. In fact, I had become an emotional burden to her, just like she had been a burden to me in Shanghai. What was there left to say? I did not see Unchen again. Early the next day, I descended the hill and immediately returned to Shanghai. My life in Shanghai returned to its usual grind. Petty quarrels and social engagements kept me busy and I had my share of ups and downs. I was hoping that I would quickly forget Unchen, yet she would invariably appear in my mind in moments of fatigue and loneliness, even though our worlds were so far apart. In the years that followed, I wandered aimlessly. I indulged in wine and women, and I got worn down by poverty and sickness, living out of tiny rooms. I threw myself into frivolous affairs and participated in noisy brawls. I changed from one job to the next and drifted from place to place. I married, got divorced, raised kids, went to America and Europe. I sold my songs and my stories and everything else to make ends meet. And in the end, I drifted to Hong Kong. I forgot Yun Qian. I forgot her a long time ago. But every time I travel to the countryside and gaze at the mountains and streams and the lush forests, and I hear the distant singing of birds, the figure of Yun Qian faintly flashes into my memory. But it's just like a fleecy cloud drifting by in the sky and as soon as I return to my mundane existence, I forget her again. How many times had I thought of writing her a letter to ask her how she was doing? But when I looked at my own vulgar life, I could never muster the courage to disturb her pure and peaceful soul. Yet when I received the Diamond Sutra through the mail, I realized at once that it was the one that we had studied together on our third day at the convent sitting at a table in the small courtyard. The letter and the sutra had been sent from my grandmother's village. I did not know which of my relatives still lived there or how they had gotten hold of my address. That, of course, was not too difficult since many of my relatives and friends in Shanghai knew of my whereabouts. 
In any case, I had no desire to know. I looked at myself in the mirror. What a vulgar face. I tossed away the mirror. As my tears fell on the open sutra, my eyes caught sight of the line in the opening chapter. All sentient beings, whether born from eggs or born from a womb, or born from moisture or born through metamorphosis, will eventually be led by me to enter nirvana where all their anguish will be extinguished. Wow. Yeah, you know, I often think that a, a translator is a kind of an actor, right? <laughs> You're using the medium of English to perform the business of being Shushu or being his narrator, right? Um, tell us a little bit about how you approach the job of translating, right? Because I think everybody does it a little bit differently. And I'd be curious to know, you know, what do you have on your desk? What do you have in your mind? What do you put on the paper? Yeah. Um, you know, um, this was really hard. I, I, <laughs> the, I took a long time. I said, you know, I, I did this during a sabbatical a couple of years ago. That was only half the truth. I, I really started a long time ago. And, and a couple of years ago, I finally sort of polished it up. Um, you know, part of the difficulty, I think, with this collection, and there is a total of five short stories, is that the collection really spans Shushu's entire career from the 1930s through to the 60s. And as a result, you know, his language and his narrative style really changed. Um, and I think the stories and the narrative voice and the narrator and Shushu himself is, you know, very different. So, um, you know, there's the cosmopolitanism and the exotism of the, you know, the, the, the pre-war period and then, you know, the wartime. And then we have this sort of subdued nostalgia later on. And then a lighter and almost more popular tone in his later Hong Kong works. So, you know, I, I, I couldn't sort of find uh, one singular voice, I think, I, I was trying to capture. Um, but I really, I wanted to capture, um, you know, what these stories might have evoked to his readers at the time, you know, the Shanghai of you know, the, the pre-war period, the foreign concessions, um, then, you know, maybe the melancholy of the, the post-war period of the, the, the exile. But I think that, you know, there, there is sort of a distinct literariness to, to almost all of these stories, which I, I hope I, I, I managed to capture. Um, you know, you, you, you sort of touched upon this idea of the authorial uh, personality. Um, you know, considering how much time I have spent with Xu Xu, kind of the, the past 15 years, um, I'm almost a little embarrassed at how little I managed to translate. Only five of these stories. <laughs> but <laughs> maybe because I spent so much time with him and also spent so much time with tr just these stories, I feel I've really gotten to know him really well. Um, I feel really close to him. I, I, I like him and I, I, I hope he would have liked me. <laughs> and, uh, I, I, um, I had the good fortune of meeting also, uh, his son, his eldest son and his youngest daughter. So in, in, in Hong Kong, Xu, she married again and, and he had a daughter. So his son, Incho and his, his daughter, Fiametta Xu, they were very uh, gracious and they provided me actually with a lot of, um, personal documents, letters, uh, uh, photographs, uh, uh, audio recordings, actually even a, a handwritten manuscript. And um, actually I have a, a slide of that. Maybe we can pull that up. Yeah, let's see that. And um, all of that really made me feel so close to, to Shushi the man. And um, I, I felt, um, because I, I, I felt so close to him, I, I felt even more that I had to do justice to these uh, short stories. Um, of course, only the readers will will tell whether or not I, I managed to do that. But you know, when it comes to sort of imagining um, maybe an equivalent or sort of a literary voice that might resemble his in the Western canon, so at least for his later work from Hong Kong, uh, Burtok and beyond, um, you know, this this exile, stranded in a place where he didn't feel he belonged and he didn't really want to be. Um, 
you know, forever searching for love, um, forever searching for a, uh, you know, home, a metaphysical sanctuary. I always had to think of Hermann Hesse. He was really the person who was always on my mind, you know, the Steppenwolf or Hermann Hesse in Siddhartha or his journey to the East. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, she, she was more of a Francophile. He read a lot of French literature. He read English, American literature. But, um, you know, and I don't know whether there was any influence, but, you know, Hesse, of course, had gotten a Nobel Prize in 1947. I'm sure he, he read Hesse. And I wonder if he might have felt that same sort of artistic kinship. Um, you know, in the afterword um, of my uh, anthology, I'm trying to place Shushu into the context of the 20th century revival of Romanticism. And Hesse, of course, also squarely fits into that, you know, neo-romantic writer uh, par excellence. Um, Now, something else is interesting. You know, Shushu in Hong Kong often designed his own book covers. And um, there is a collection from 1964. And again, we have a slide for that. Maybe we can pull that up. He chose um, a painting by Marc Chagall to adorn the cover of that collection. And, you know, that completely makes sense in my mind because Chagall, of course, also an exile, um, eternally feeling nostalgia for a different period, a different time. Um, And, you know, like Shushu, always seeking out the real within dreams. You know, this line that I quoted earlier, I think that can be applied just as well um, to Chagall. So again, and Chagall, of course, likewise, I think we can place maybe into the, the you know, this huge context of, of romanticism, revival of romanticism, um, surrealism. Mm-hmm. So again, I think he, he felt an artistic kinship. Um, and what I really find fascinating about this is that Shushu in Hong Kong, in a way, was sort of able to tap into a global artistic uh, modernity in the way artists in China at the time, of course, were not able, and even in Taiwan probably were not able to. Yeah. You know, one thing about exile is it turns people into jacks of all trades, right? Because (laughs) Maybe you had a profession in your, in your homeland, but once you go abroad, you'll end up doing something else, right? Think of all the brain surgeons who are driving taxi cabs in New York or San Francisco. And Shushu is another case of this, right? Because when he gets to Hong Kong, he, he uh, reinvents himself as a teacher. He writes for the movies. Uh, he even appears in movies, and I think you have a clip. Uh, yeah. You know, film for him is kind of going together with his experience of exile a little bit, being exiled from his writing profession in some way. That's right, yeah. Um, So, you know, this connection to cinema, um, actually that even goes back to to, to the pre-war period. So his Mm. novella Ghost Love, Gui Lian, that had already been turned into a movie in the 30s, in the late 30s, early 40s. But then, um, you know, this really does continue very much in Hong Kong. So after the war, of course, the Shanghai movie industry pretty much, you know, with its most illustrious stars, relocates to Hong Kong. And in Hong Kong, uh, a half dozen of his novels uh, were turned into movies. And I actually have a couple of movie posters. Maybe we can pull those up. Um, Yeah, let's... um, so there is a movie, Homan, uh, Back Entrance from 1960. There is a later movie, The River of Fury, based on another really you know, important novel, Jiang Hu Xing from 1973. But um, I really wanted to share a little clip with you, um, which is uh, uh, from a movie called Blind Love, Mang Lian, uh, based on a novel you know, of the same title. The film is uh, from 1955. And like a lot of movies from that time, it's a Mandarin movie, you know, it's in Mandarin. And Xu Xu, this is really interesting, plays a cameo role. There he is uh, in the opening. It's a tragic love story about a blind, a blind girl who falls in love with a famous writer who is a disfigured hunchback. And the novel is actually set, there he is, a nice, uh, uh, this is the face of Xu Xu. He looks at this, this, this hunchback there. 
Uh, the novel is set in Shanghai, but the movie is actually set in Hong Kong. So uh, this happens a lot with, with movies. Um, sort of probably to make it more appealing to that Hong Kong audience. And so he, he this, this hunchback, uh, he, he drops this stack of papers and Xu Xu, right, he picks it up um, and, um, you know, he, he looks at this, this, this graveyard and maybe, you know what, we, he then takes this stack of paper to this party that his friends are hosting. And it turns out that these friends are all really famous movie stars. And, um, <laughs> and you know, they end up being the, the cast in the movie. Maybe we can pull up the, the volume here. I was Luoye, Tagangsoshale Good. And then, yeah, there we have um, the cast, Xu Xu right there in the middle um, in that living room we just saw. <laughs> oh, great. And yeah, I mean, just to put the geopolitical frame around this, uh, Hong Kong is really the place in the Chinese speaking world where film can grow as a genre, right? Because in Taiwan, film was tightly controlled under the period of martial law. And in the mainland in the 60s and 70s, you had just the uh, Yang Ban Xi, right? The eight model operas, which means that Hong Kong film has the freedom to grow and also, I think, a kind of a pressure to grow, right? Because there's a lot of creativity that needs an outlet and this is it, right? Yeah. Tell us more about uh, Xu Xu as uh, as person in film, if you can, and maybe how his his film and his fiction and his activity as a cultural figure in the classroom all mesh together. Yeah. So um, you know, as you you sort of mentioned earlier, he you know when he he comes to Hong Kong, yeah, he he does a lot of things. He and, you know, it was very difficult to make a living in Hong Kong in the 1950s as a writer. Um, you know, obviously, there was a much smaller reading. A lot of competition. <laughs> yeah, and a lot of competition. So he taught at a number of different schools at Zhuhai and, and uh, Xinya, New Asia College. He later ended up um, being, uh, you know, a professor of Chinese at Baptist University. He chaired the Chinese program, later actually became dean of the School of Humanities. And he, you know, really trained. Um, and I think, you know, maybe Chris, we can go back. Well, it actually, it doesn't matter. Um, we, um, I had an image of him uh, lecturing, but, you know, we, we, we don't need to see that. Um, so he really trained, uh, you know, a whole generation, I think, of, of, of younger writers and, and, and scholars. A few years ago uh, in Hong Kong, I, um, I, I had the pleasure of meeting one of his former students, uh, Lu Weiluan, who of course became a prominent scholar of, of literature in Hong Kong and a writer herself. She's, as a writer, she's better known as Xiao Si under her pen name. Um, he, she, she also uh, edited um, a bunch of literary journals uh, and, you know, he edited them and he also contributed them. So he was very active as a critic. He, he wrote uh, cultural criticism, uh, literary criticism, film criticism. He wrote, he, he be, later in life, he began to write a literary history of, of Chinese literature. Um, and a lot of these journals, uh, you know, they, they were very important in that they introduced uh, Western literature, Japanese literature, um, 
and you know foreign cultural trends and of course post-war Hong Kong in many ways was the only place in the Chinese-speaking world at the time that enjoyed a free press, only very limited uh, censorship. And Xu Xu with his cosmopolitan outlook, his broad interest in the arts, greatly facilitated the, the influx of new ideas. And something else is very important, um, uh, you know, uh, P.K. Lung, Yang Jun, he told me this, and he actually wrote about this himself, was that, you know, for younger Hong Kong writers like him, Xu Xu was not, a, they didn't particularly like Xu Xu's fiction because mm. it was so steeped in the mainland. You know, it was of a bygone era. It was not about Hong Kong. It was certainly not about their Hong Kong, the city that they, they were proud of. Mm. But he said that Xu Xu really was so important because he provided a platform through these literary journals and because he was so well known, he pr provided a platform for a burgeoning community of writers. Yeah. So I think, um, you know, that, that he, he did play a very important role. Yeah, uh, I see him as having a lot of territory uh, in common with Zhang Ailing. You know, just now in that little clip, he mentioned uh, Qi Tan and Qi Liang as, uh, you know, modifiers of the story he's about to tell. And Qi Liang is a very important word for Zhang Ailing, too, describing yeah. her own fiction. And as I put these two characters in my mind and run them in parallel, two things come out, right? One is that, you know, as we know, Zhang Ailing became more and more reclusive as she grew older. And you can't imagine her being a public figure or, or a teacher, you know, that's sort of tragic. In another sense though, she lived longer and she was able to see the transformation of the mainland in the 1980s. You know, yeah. and she, she dies in 1980 just as things are beginning to open up. And that's, that's kind of ironic, right? All of this cosmopolitanism that he was putting into action and that Zhang Ailing too was, you know, that was second nature for her to be a, a citizen of the world on the page yeah. or in life. Uh, all of that he was unable to see. So I, it becomes part of his afterlife, right? Um, and, you know, your translation too is, is part of his afterlife. Uh, what, what do you think would be his, uh, his society, his posse, his club of admirers and friends if he were alive today? Who are the writers you think might have the most in common with him now? Yeah, you know, um, what you said there, it, it's true. His, his passing was very untimely because really only just a couple of years later, he was rediscovered in China. Um, you know, during the cultural fever of the 1980s, uh, you know, him and Lin Yutang as well, really, because of their cosmopolitanism, because of their liberal politics, you know, their emphasis on individualism, their critical interest in East-West cultural encounters, that, of course, was, you know, so important to intellectuals in the 1980s, you know, who had experienced, of course, decades of political extremism, antagonism towards the West. So, um, um, you know, and there was, and there still is a lot of interest in him. Uh, you know, a lot of his works were published throughout the eighties. Then, um, you know, there was a new movie on, on, based on ghost love in the nineties. His complete works in 16 volumes were reissued in China in 2008. Uh, also in, in, um, in, 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 in Taiwan. Um, in, actually, even in Hong Kong in 2015, uh, right, the, the, you have that, um, there's a new an, uh, anthology of his, his, his works um, came out. But, you know, in mainland China, so the Shanghai writer Wang Anyi actually just a few years ago uh, took this novel, Feng Xiao Xiao, The Rustling Wind, and turned it into a play. Um, in Hong Kong, there was a, uh, uh, just a couple of years ago, a chamber opera based on Gui Lian. Um, you know, you mentioned his, his, his sort of his club writers who would, have, who would have liked him. You know, the Taiwanese writer Sun Mao mm. um, had a very close relationship with him to, near the uh, um, end of his life. They, they um, exchanged over 50 letters and she loved his work and he liked her work. And I think, you know, this exoticism uh, we find in both of them, right? We find in both of their works. She sort of takes it a step further. She actually goes to these places. She, she lives in the Sahara and she writes about it and she marries a foreign husband. 
So um, I think it's not, no surprise that they, you know, again, they, they, <laughs> uh, they just clicked, you know. Um, but so there, I think there's something kind of interesting um, that his, uh, the people who really carry on his work in a kind of posthumous tradition are women writers, right? There's yeah. a certain orthodoxy of thinking that says, well, that this, this sort of epistemology of longing, you know, this idea of the male gaze uh, where the woman is always an exotic and somehow forbidden territory, people would just condemn that as a kind of a weird literary voyeurism. But here are women writers who say, I can deal with this. I'm, I'm not intimidated or objectified by this writing. I see something that makes me a more active subject, right? And that's, that's kind of inspiring and, and unpredictable. Yeah, no, I completely agree. You know, I actually, my editor had been a little worried about the fact when he kind of read the, you know, the draft of the manuscript, my translations, and he sort of, you know, we were in the middle of the Me Too movement and he said, um, he, he does like his young girls, right? And uh, creepy there. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, what you just said, I have heard this from a lot of um, female uh, uh, readers who all said, you know, we really like these strong female characters in all of these stories. No. And, you know, in a way they're right. A lot of these female characters really are very strong um, and, 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 and dominate the narratives. And, you know, what is really interesting, um, you know, Xu, this, is, this is a sort of going back to sort of the afterlife of Xu Xu. One thing that I find really interesting is that Hong Kong has started to claim Xu Xu as a Hong Kong writer. Uh, you know, I mentioned earlier that a lot of younger Hong Kong writers didn't particularly like Xu Xu because he felt like a Chinese writer. He didn't write about Hong Kong. Yeah. But um, I think that has changed. And, um, you know, Isabel Zhang um, wrote a book review of, this book, of my translation for the South China Morning Post. And, you know, the, the, the review was titled something like in Xu Xu's short stories, Hong Kong is a symbol of new beginnings and opportunity. And I thought that was really fascinating because in a way, there's really only one story in the collection which is really about Hong Kong. Mm. Um, but in her review, she makes all of these stories about Hong Kong, even though, you know, the first one is set in Shanghai and the second one is really about Shanghai, but she sort of, she makes Xu Xu relevant to, to readers in Hong Kong at this moment in time. And I thought that was fascinating, but again, it kind of makes sense because Xu Xu in so many ways um, was always um, somewhat of an outsider, you know, in Shanghai, when the progressive writers sort of, you know, had espoused realism, there he is doing his exoticism, his kind of, you know, defying, the real, during the wartime, he doesn't write this sort of black and white wartime fiction about, you know, the invader and the victim, but he has a lot of these sort of almost existentialist works. He has a couple of plays where you have two brothers finding each themselves on opposite sides of the conflict. Um, and then in Hong Kong, you know, he goes to Hong Kong, a place that he doesn't particularly like. He could have easily gone to Taiwan. You know, he was so well known, but he refuses to align himself with either of the two authoritarian regimes. And mm -hmm. instead, you know, he decides to remain in exile in, in Hong Kong. So I think it, it makes sense to that, you know, um, Xu Xu as a, you know, as, a, as an intellectual would maybe resonate with, with readers and intellectuals at this moment in, in, in history. Yeah, yeah, to bring it back to the French tradition, which was always so important to him, it's a little bit like the difference between Camus and Sartre, right? For Sartre, it was important always to identify the enemy and be ready to combat. And Camus knew that everybody has part of the enemy inside themselves and that you know, the struggle is in a different place. You know, um, Fred, we're, we're at the end of our hour 
Um, I don't usually do product placement, but I think uh, the people listening to us today should know that this book, uh, beautifully translated by you, is published by Stonebridge Press of Berkeley, California. I don't know if it's available in Hong Kong bookstores, but people can order it over the internet. And I think uh, we, we might salute the existence of small independent publishers who are our great hope for publishing works in translation in an English language market where translated books don't occupy a big space. Right? It, it would be harder to get published by you know, one of the major publishing conglomerates who shall remain nameless. So bravo to Stonebridge for doing what they do. I think we should move into the question and answer, if you don't mind, because no. we have several interesting and provocative questions. Uh, one of our audience members uh, notes the different places where she, she taught uh, in Hong Kong and in Singapore, uh, uh, in particularly in Xinya Shu Yuan, right? One of the yeah. constituent colleges of Chinese University of Hong Kong and in uh, Hong Kong Baptist University. And this questioner wants to know about his religious affiliations. We saw the Buddhism, the Jing Gang Jing, the Diamond Sutra coming up in, in bird talk. What about Christianity? Is there a relation between Buddhism and Christianity in his thinking or in his life that you want to bring yeah. out? You know, that's a really, really great question. Um, and one that I discuss a little bit in the afterword of the, you know, my translation. So I talked earlier about this connection to romanticism and that I place Xu Xu in the context of 20th century romanticism. And I mentioned Hesse as somebody who I always thought of when I was reading, especially his later work. And both Hesse and Xu Xu share this interest in religion, but it's not institutionalized religion. It's really more religion as, you know, how it connects us with other spheres. Yeah, self-discovery too. Yeah, yeah. And so many of Xu Xu's later works from Hong Kong have a religious aspect. There's mm. you know, Buddhism, there's Christianity. He has this beautiful novel called Bian, The Other Shore, a journey mm. of self-discovery, which really resonates with Siddhartha, I, I find. Mm. Um, you know, I don't know. I, I, don't, I don't think he was particularly religious. That being said, before he passed away, he was baptized. Um, but um, again, you know, throughout his life, I think there was a philosophical interest mm -hmm. in religion um, more than, um, you know, and, and a spiritual, but really more in the sense of, um, yeah, this journey of self-discovery uh, yeah. and a journey to different spheres. Yeah, well, Hegel, who was wrong about everything, uh, but we can let him have a point once in a while, uh, said that Christianity is the religion of romanticism, right? So maybe, maybe that's where the pieces fit together. Um, another uh, viewer wants to know about the relation of Xu Xu's fiction to traditional Chinese fiction, in particular Liao Jai, and the way that Liao Jai might be an inspiration for revival of romanticism. Uh, in 20th and 21st century. Uh, is that maybe part of uh, cosmopolitanism that isn't just about embracing Western influences, but also going back into the Chinese past for influences? What do you think? Fantastic question. And I apologize. Um, you know, I think as scholars in the West, we have a tendency to, to sort of say, or, or to spot influences. And, you know, I guess it's a bad tendency to say, well, you know, 20th century writer who studied in, in Paris and who liked Bergson must have been influenced, right? I shouldn't have said influenced. I should have said interested. Yeah. And if anything, he probably recognized, you know, the, the similarities, right? Similarities. And I mean, this whole idea of romanticism, um, you know, something that struck me a while ago, I, I, you know, I was working on a, on a, a, paint, uh, um, a paper on, uh, on visual art and painting, and I was sort of looking at 10th century Chinese landscape paintings, and it dawned on me that in the, this idea of not wanting to be realist painters, but really to depict a landscape that exists in your mind, mm -hmm. what the romantic 
painters in the 19th century wanted to do, the Chinese did in the 12th century, right? So <laughs> in a way we can say they were romantics way before we were. Yeah. Um, and yes, absolutely, you know, Xu Xu, of course, in his early education was very much steeped in classical literature. Um, the Liao Jai actually comes up several times in the stories that I translate. So in Guilian, Ghost Love, he keeps saying, man, this is all like a story out of the Liao Jai. What's happening to me? And in another story, um, the All Souls Tree by Ling Shu, the same, you know, he's like, am I reliving a story from the Liao Jai Ji? So absolutely. <laughs> The inner yeah. textuality with, with Chinese fiction is there all the time. But what I find so interesting... The reader will notice it too. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. But you know what I find so interesting about so many of these Republican period writers is that they were so well versed in traditional Chinese literature, but they also all read at least one foreign language. You know, they read French, they read English, and, you know, they, they could converse culturally between different influences, different cultures. So um, definitely, I, I shouldn't have said, um, you know, influenced. I should have said, yes, interested. Um, yeah, well, it's, it's a funny thing. I mean, the, this is the word that the academic tradition gives us, influence, right? But influence is kind of a passive relationship. And, you know, I think you're right, that it's much more an active going out and seeking and, and being in conversation with with these uh, many sources, right? Because you're always refashioning something as a writer. You know, you couldn't, if you're a writer of any talent, you couldn't simply imitate. You would have to bring new things into, uh, into relation. Um, now, to shift gears a little bit, you know, when you're a translator, you're basically a, uh, a spokesman in a way, right? You're an advocate for the work. Your, your job is to perform it and to make it vivid and to convince readers that this is what they want to spend their time and attention on. How about the classroom? Do you have a different take on Xu Xu uh, when you bring it into the classroom? Do you have certain analytic styles? Do you do, you know, content analysis or an eco-poetics framework or a historical causality framework? What's, what's the deal when you bring this book into the classroom, if you do, maybe maybe you have a separation of church and state in your classroom <laughs> life and your translator life. I don't know that. You know, I, I I think I will. I probably will bring it to the classroom. Up until this point, I I sometimes assign Shushu to our graduate students. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, and they read them in Chinese. Mm -hmm. And what's interesting is that for the most part, um, you know, the the students and we have a lot of students from China, from mainland China and and from Taiwan, and usually they don't know him, um, and they read him, and they always love him, and you know they usually say, "Wow, this was this was um this was our favorite story." Yeah. But I had this one experience which I want to share. You know, um, not uh, uh, you know, in the vicinity of San Francisco, there is a big Buddhist monastery, the Wan Fo Cheng in um, Ukiah. Which is, yeah. I think, it's the largest or one of the largest Buddhist monasteries outside of Asia. Asia. I've been and there. a few years ago, we had a nun, a Buddhist nun from that, um, you know, um, monastery uh, convent, attend our MA program, and she took a class with me in in uh, modern Chinese literature, and we read that story. And she came to me during my office hours, and she said, "Dr. Green, this is the most beautiful story I've ever read. I, I wanted to thank you." And she just could relate to the story in so many ways. Um, and she invited me afterwards to the convent. <laughs> and <laughs> so it's beautiful things came out of the story. Yeah. Um, yeah. So. Hey, did you go? Did you go to? Ukraine? Yeah, 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 yeah. I went. <laughs> I went and, we, and I went back and, um, uh, w w with friends. So, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, that's great. Well, I think this puts to rest our, our uh, worry that uh, Xu Xu might not have readers because he does. And now he has a new uh, and very big community of readers in the English language, thanks to you. Thanks to you. Frederick, this has been really delightful talking with you about this book. I think we've reached uh, the end of the period allotted to us. We were able to cover most of the questions. 
Uh, I'm very grateful to the center in Hong Kong for staging this event and to our participants for overcoming the barrier of Zoom and being secluded in our houses and uh, all of the anxieties of the moment to come and join us around this extraordinary writer uh, and his talented translator. Um, I think it's been a great morning for me, evening perhaps for those in Hong Kong. Thank you, Frederick. Well, thank you. Thank you, Han, and thank you everybody uh, at the University of Chicago and the Hong Kong campus for making this happen. And thank you for the audience for tuning in. This was really a wonderful experience.